So this is the uh, review of the 2024 protocol assessment, um, and it's going to be presented by me alone this year. So um, this year uh, we do have a uh, protocol assessment. will be distributed to your uh, EMS coordinators and on to you uh, later this month. And uh, the requirement is that everybody review this material or review the protocol assessment and this video by the end of February. So as with previous years, this is an open book review of the protocol. Um, some questions are similar to previous years and that's done because of emphasis. Um, I encourage that you uh, do this as a group event. Um, you can do it as an individual person, but I think you'll learn more by reviewing the questions and this video uh, as a group. Um, this is pass-fail. There is no passing grade. To uh, pass this assessment you ha or this uh, review and get credit, you have to take the assessment either alone or as a group and then view this entire video. So pretty straightforward. Um, it's not... Uh, something meant to be stressful, uh, and it's really meant to encourage uh, conversation and thought and discussion among the, the EMS providers. But first, um, before we get into the assessment, I just want to go back to um, behavioral emergency protocol, uh, which we've had in place for several years. Uh, we currently have uh, ketamine as our drug of choice. It is in short supply. I discussed this at the December MEC Minute, our mishmash uh, MEC Minute, and I just want to reemphasize some things. So uh, as part of the protocol, uh, which becomes effective January 22nd, you'll have uh, two different medication choices uh, for patients who are acutely agitated. You can continue with uh, ketamine, or you can use drapiridol and midazolam for patients with a plus two or plus three SAT score. And um, I've put it up in such a way that ketamine remains the preferred drug. However, if the ketamine is in short supply and needs to be conserved, uh, then uh, you can switch over to drapiridol and midazolam. Um, it's already on or will be on your drug license once it's updated. And you don't need my permission to make a transition, but I do want to know. So if your agency is transitioning uh, or uh, beginning to use drapiridol instead of ketamine, I just want to know about it, and the EMS coordinator can simply send me a text message or an email. So this is the final appearance of the algorithms uh, for it. If you look on the left-hand side, uh, SAT of plus two and plus three, this is for adults. This is what you will see. It's based on a weight-dosed uh, formula, so less than 50 kilos, 50 to 99 kilos, and over 100 kilos. And um, the dosing is adjusted based on whether it's an SA2, SA plus two or a plus three. If you administer a dose of medication and in 10 minutes the patient still requires some additional sedation, you give a half dose of the original dose of Versed. So if your original dose of midazolam or Versed was 5 milligrams, the patient needs additional sedation, you give them another 2.5. Uh, for now, though, we're only going to do one-time dose of uh, drapiridol. On the right-hand side, we see this for children. Um, so for uh, children to receive uh, drapiridol and midazolam, it's, uh, they have to be 25 kilos or more. And the drapiridol dosing is based on weight for the patients who are between 25 and 49 kilos. Over 50 kilos, pretty much they're going to go with the adult dose of, uh, of drapiridol and midazolam. And uh, we're still using uh, equal are still using doses of drapiridol plus midazolam, and you have to make the calculations. And with children, as with adults, if you need additional sedation, you give it a second dose of midazolam. That is at one half the original dose. So I think it's important as we talk about uh, sedation and behavioral emergencies, um, we look at some things that have come up recently. And I'm going to spend more time in February talking about this as well. But if you've been paying any attention, there have been some significant court actions that have taken place over the past year in regards to ketamine administered to patients who then have a bad outcome. Uh, just recently in Colorado, two EMS providers were convicted of felonies related to uh, administration of ketamine and patient having um, unexpected death. Uh, that's the Elijah McLean case. Um, there are a lot of different things that can be discussed about this, but the fact of the matter is uh, EMS uh, is responsible for patient care. So, <coughs> excuse me, what I've got here are 10 talking points in terms of enhancing patient safety. Um, you know, prolonged prone restraint is inherently dangerous. So if you look at the patients who died after ketamine, they are typically in a prone position by law enforcement with the hands behind the back. Um, 
So that is dangerous. It can develop positional asphyxia, and that asphyxia can get worse um, while the patient is restrained on their belly. Uh, only proceed if the patient remains an active threat to self or others. Now, you notice that I capitalized and emphasized the word patient. Um, for law enforcement officers, they are um, someone other than the patient, but for you, if you're going to evaluate the person and administer medication, they are a patient of yours, and patient safety is paramount, and you are responsible for providing appropriate monitoring. So if the patient is uh, still an active threat to themselves or others, you should sedate. If the patient is no longer sedated, or I'm sorry, no longer an active threat, there is no indication for uh, chemical restraint. Um, do not administer chemical sedation uh, the, at the request of law enforcement. You are providing care for this person who is now a patient, and you are responsible for an independent patient assessment. Before you proceed, identify any other potential organic causes of the patient's agitation. Hypoglycemia is the easy one. So if you have an opportunity to check the finger's blood sugar before you administer medications, I would take that opportunity. Uh, be aware of uh, unconscious and anchoring bias. You are called uh, on a behavioral emergency. The police are on the scene. The perspective uh, we often have is this patient is somebody who wants to act out or has a behavioral emergency consider the other things such as hypoxia and hypoglycemia. You can also think about an alternative agent. So for us, that could be Versed by itself. It could be uh, Drapiridol and Versed. But you know, think about other medications that might, you might be able to use to sedate the patient. For us, we're kind of limited, though, with, with ketamine and midazolam. Uh, never administer chemical sedation to a patient in a prone position. If you look at the patients that die after ketamine, it's typically patients who are in a prone position prior to EMS arrival and after they are sedated or at least receive the sedating medication. Here's an important point that I think that you all need to keep in mind and should be a learning point from these other bad outcomes. All monitoring and resuscitative equipment must be at the patient's side before you proceed. So if you're going to a behavioral emergency, the police have somebody in a prone position, you should be uh, coming out of the truck with a cardiac monitor, um, appropriate uh, airway equipment, and um, medications that you might need, such as treatment for hypoglycemia. During sedation, uh, you have to be focused on monitoring the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. Again, if you look at the videos that came out of these episodes, EMS walks up, hits the patient with a dose of ketamine, they walk away, and uh, the patient then gets in trouble or their respiratory uh, symptoms are not uh, found on a timely basis. And on some of the videos, it's actually law enforcement officers who identify the patient stopped breathing, not EMS. And then uh, obese patients, uh, as well as patients who are on other sedative drugs or alcohol, uh, are at increased risk of apnea. So if the patient's intoxicated or obese, have that extra spidey sense that this patient might get into trouble. So again, uh, we'll, we'll spend more talking about this next month, but this has become a big issue at national meetings. It is a concern that we should all have. We need to maintain patient safety uh, when we administer these medications. And I think uh, Colorado is a wake-up call. EMS has protections by state law, but it's only if you act um, appropriately. If you do not follow protocol, do not uh, act in the patient's best interest, uh, your indemnification by the state for liability goes away. And you can be uh, either sued, uh, crim uh, sued uh, through the courts or you can be arrested and charged with some criminal offense. All right, getting back to the meat of the potatoes here. So question one. So if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, protocol assessment, uh, you arrive on scene, there's a 20 to 30-some-year-old male on the pavement outside a bar with a he large head wound. Bystanders say he was hit in the head with a baseball bat. His GCS is 10, his O2 saturation is 92%, and his systolic blood pressure is 85. He's maintaining his airway. There's a large amount of blood surrounding the patient's head, um, which um, actions are appropriate. So uh, you think about what we talked about in the past with patients and head injuries. Um, we want to avoid hypoxia, so high flow oxygen is important. His O2 saturation is borderline. Um, there is no uh, concern about using too much oxygen in these head injured patients. Um, so yes, the patient should get high flow oxygen. Should you give them two grams of TXA? My answer to that is yes. If you look at our revised protocol, uh, if the patient has a isolated or an isolated head injury and they have a GCS of 9 to 12, they are a candidate for TXA. 
Uh, should they get a fluid bolus? Uh, my answer to that is yes. Patient's blood pressure is 85. We want to get the patient's systolic blood pressure at least over 100. Uh, again, that's because of a head injury. With head injuries, we want to have a higher uh, goal systolic pressure than if, if the patient does not have a head injury. Does the patient require intubation? Uh, I don't think so at this point. Uh, his GCS is 10, his O2 saturation is okay, and he's maintaining his airway. So for me, uh, the correct answer is A, B, and C. Question two, you have a mother in labor. She's gravity five, para four, she's 36 weeks along. Uh, looks like delivery is imminent with the baby's head uh, at the presenting part. You deliver the baby and the baby has a weak cry and is blue, purple in color and has a weak tone. You cut the umbilical cord and provide neonatal resuscitation with drying, stimulating, suctioning the baby. Baby quickly develops a strong cry and has improved color and tone and heart rate is 140. O2 saturation is 90%. What are the next best steps? So, you know, the patient doesn't necessarily need uh, high flow oxygen at this point uh, because they are pulse rates up. Uh, their O2 rate will come up. Uh, this patient does not need uh, an IV, uh, and per perhaps uh, even starting an IV in a child would be difficult. Uh, you don't need to deep suction the mouth and nose. That can cause apnea. And really, the goal is to keep the baby uh, warm, put the baby on his mom's chest, and keep the vehicle warm. So that first minute or two, it's, it's all about drying, stimulating, and suctioning. Uh, pr you can provide some supplement oxygen, but I think in this case it's not needed because the heart rate's over 140. The O2 saturation will come up in the next couple minutes. So. Really, the, the biggest action you need is keep the baby warm, put the baby on the mom's chest for heat, uh, wrap the baby, and don't forget to put something on the baby's head because there's a lot of uh, heat that can be lost uh, through an uncovered head, particularly if you're in a cool environment. Question three, uh, patient um, has been resuscitated by you after you've obtained ROSC, what should you do? Um, should you remove the ITD, um, you know, uh, the rescue pod? Should you keep stay on scene for five, 10 minutes to assure stabilization? Should you remove the wedge? Um, should you mix up an epi drip to treat potential hypotension? Um, and uh, should you obtain a 12 lead ECG? So this is pick all that apply. Well, yes, uh, you should remove the ITD. Once you have ROSC, the ITD is no longer indicated. If you look at our revised protocol, we've said we're gonna stay on scene for five to 10 minutes to assure stabilization and make sure we have everything we need in case the patient re-arrests. Um, we do not remove the wedge uh, at current, based on our current protocol. We will mix up an epi drip to treat potential hypotension. So I think the important thing here is if you have ROSC, you mix up the drip. Whether you use it or not is less important, but you have that drip available in case you need to push dose pressors or start an epinephrine infusion. So if you have ROSC, you mix up the drip. If you waste it, you waste it, but we need to have it ready and available. Otherwise, it may take you precious time to get it mixed up to give the patient if they start uh, getting into trouble. So we want it readily available, and we always want to get a 12 lead in a patient who's post-arrest. You know, are they a STEMI or not? Um, do they need a cath lab? So uh, A, B, D, and E are the correct answers. Here's another one. And um, this patient uh, is a 21-year-old. Um, he called you because his heart was beating fast and he felt lightheaded. Uh, on your arrival, he was awake, alert, with normal vital signs. His rhythm strip is below. So if you look down at this rhythm strip, he's in, looks like maybe a little bradycardia, uh, and he's got a funny-looking uh, waveform of, between the P wave and the QRS. Um, so you notice that, and then he abruptly becomes unresponsive, and you see this uh, rhythm on the uh, monitor strip below. So you have some wide, complex tachycardic rhythm. So what are your treatment options? So... Um, you know, uh, you can sedate and cardiovert the patient, so it all depends on what their vital signs are. You can administer cardiozem over two minutes. You can administer amiodarone over three to five minutes, or you can administer adenosine. So which do you think are the correct answers? I think A and C are correct. Um, if this patient abruptly develops this wide complex tachycardia, if they have no pressure, if they go unconscious, you can, you can uh, cardiovert the patient. Uh, Cardozem is not indicated in this case, um, and um, uh, adenosine is not indicated, but you can use amiodarone, uh, 150 milligrams IV, over three to five minutes because you have a wide complex tachycardia. So if you look at this um, rhythm strip, uh, if you notice, like I mentioned, you've got these abnormal waveforms, which is a delta wave. This patient has Wolf-Parkinson-White 
um, and which is characterized by a short PR interval um, and uh, a widened QRS duration. And it's that delta wave, that slurred upstroke, that's got the red arrow to it. So uh, this patient is WPW. Um, the patient uh, is at risk to develop tachyarrhythmias. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is if you have a patient with WPW and, atrial fibril and a history of atrial fibrillation with tachycardia, uh, cardizem is really not a drug to use. I've seen this maybe once in my past 20, year, 20 years at East, um, so it doesn't happen often, but if a patient has WPW and now is an atrial fibrillation, um, do not use cardizem. You can safely use amiodarone if you have to for rate control. All right, you're a dispatcher on a behavioral emergency. On arrival, you find a diaphoretic middle-aged female weighing about 60 pounds, screaming and throwing bricks at several law enforcement officers. They are able to restrain her. What are your treatment options? So you can give her 120 milligrams of ketamine IV. Uh, you could give her droperidol, five milligrams plus five milligrams of midazolam, IM. You can give them ketamine, 240 milligrams, IM, or midazolam, 10 milligrams, IM. So, how would you, what would you do for this patient? So for me, I would go with either uh, droperidol or ketamine IM. Uh, you know, the patient is uh, awake and screaming, uh, 60 kilos. The ketamine, 120 milligrams IVP is a possibility, but if you have a violent patient, why are you trying to start a line? Uh, droperidol, as I mentioned earlier, is now in the protocol and based on her weight of 60 uh, kilograms, uh, five milligrams of droperidol plus five of midazolam is a treatment option, as is ketamine 240 milligrams, which is four milligrams per kilogram IM. Midazolam 10 milligrams IM is available as an option, but for lower levels of agitation. So I would say this patient is a plus three. Uh, I'm not going to worry about trying to start an IV. Uh, but I am going to uh, give her intramuscular either ketamine or intramuscular drapiridol and midazolam. All right, so you treated that patient with drapiridol and midazolam, which is not an appropriate action. Should you check a finger stick? Should you put the patient face down on the gurney? Should you start cardiac monitoring plus oximetry and uh, capnography? And should you tra transport the patient to the emergency department? Well, I think if you remember on my opening comments when we talked about behavioral emergencies and patient risk, uh, placing a patient on a gurney face down is inappropriate. It's uh, actually against what's in the current protocol. It is appropriate to check a finger stick. It is appropriate to, as soon as reasonably possible and safely possible, put the patient on cardiac monitoring, uh, start them on pulse oximetry, and if at all possible, put them in waveform capnography. We all know that capnography is a more sensitive way to monitor for apnea than oximetry is. You know, pulse ox is three to five minutes after the fact, whereas if the waveforms uh, disappear for capnography, you know the patient stopped breathing. And then any patient who's uh, sedated uh, it needs to be transported to the emergency department. Here's a very basic question we've talked about recently. Uh, which statement is correct? CPAP assists ventilation and BiPAP only helps with patient oxygenation. CPAP helps with patient oxygenation, BiPAP assists with ventilation and improves oxygenation. EMTs and AMTs uh, may place the patient on BiPAP or BiPAP may be used on patients in respiratory arrest. So for me, the only correct answer is B. CPAP will help with oxygenation. BiPAP helps oxygenate but also assists ventilation. Um, so that is correct, A is wrong. In Ohio, EMTs and advanced EMTs can place a patient on CPAP only, but not on BiPAP. If you look at the device that we're rolling out this year, you can, uh, EMTs and AMTs can use it as long as they turn the dial so it's on CPAP. And then BiPAP uh, may be used, may, should not be used on you know, any patient in respiratory arrest. Those patients need uh, BVM or intubation or supraglottic like an IGEL. So the correct answer here is B. You're evaluating a two-month-old uh, for an episode of unresponsiveness. Baby, mom tells you you suddenly went limp and turned blue. Uh, baby's been sleepier today and had trouble feeding today. Only taken two ounces of formula in the past 12 hours. You examine the baby and note a large bruise on the left side of the head. When asked about the bruise, mom reports the baby rolled off the bed last night. The baby is otherwise awake and alert. Vitals are stable. What's the appropriate management? Clo transport to the closest hospital. Transport to a pediatric hospital place a C collar or uh, transport to peds and place a collar. So 
the, for me, the correct answer is B and C. If at all possible, this child should be taken to a pediatric hospital. Now, I realize for our member agencies where getting to nationwide is two counties away, uh, that may not be practical. But if at all possible, get the child to Children's uh, and also place the child in a cervical collar. If you look at this, um, the child has had head injury. Uh, a two-month-old does not roll off the bed. They don't roll till probably they're five to six months of age. So uh, this child needs to be assessed not just for the injury but for potential abuse. So transport to a children's hospital if possible. Put them in a cervical collar. Which finding is not suggestive of sepsis? So uh, redness of a recent surgical wound, fever, tachycardia, capnography of 24, or a positive home screen. Well, redness of a surgical wound suggests that there's an infection, so that could be indicative of sepsis. Fever always is suggestive of sepsis, although it could be caused by something else. Tachycardia is one of the criteria we use to screen for sepsis. And capnography of 24 is also suggestive of, of sepsis. So when you have a capnography reading of 25 or less, that is consistent with a blood lactate of four or higher. So lactate is an acid in our system we develop under stress. It is a chemical we monitor as we treat patients for sepsis. So capnography is a surrogate marker for an elevated lactate. We don't do lactates in the field. Positive home COVID screen, that doesn't, you know, COVID itself is not sepsis, so I would not consider COVID as a, uh, as a uh, measure of sepsis. So if you look at our sepsis criteria, um, it, it, redness of a surgical wound, that suggests infection. Um, there's a fever, uh, there's tachycardia, and there's capnography of, uh, with an end title of less than uh, 25. So A, B, C, and D all are suggestive of sepsis. It, just having a positive screen, COVID screen in itself is not suggestive of sepsis. All right, so we got a threefer here. So this is a clinical scenario. Uh, you've got a patient, a uh, 48 year old male, trapped from the navel down under a large bale of hay. Uh, he's alert, able to answer some questions through the pain. He's in severe pain with a blood pressure of 210 over 98. Respirations are up a little bit, but acceptable. O2 sat is fine. Uh, he weighs about 210 pounds. Uh, 12 leads shows sinus tack. And uh, he says he was getting ready for lunch when this happened, and it's now uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. So looking at our crush uh, injury scenario, how long must a patient be trapped uh, for the crush syndrome protocol to apply? And the correct answer there is 10, 50, 20 to 30 minutes. Here's the excerpt from the protocol. So if the patient's been under the bail for 10 minutes, gets extricated, probably is not a candidate. Uh, our, our goal is to get uh, the protocol started if they've been uh, trapped for 20 to 30 minutes or more. So the same patient, two uh, large, uh, large bore IVs have been initiated. What is the appropriate dose of sodium bicarb prior to release? Uh, 25 in a liter, 25 milliliters, a liter over 60, 50 in a liter over 30, 50 in a, two liters over an hour, or 25 uh, IV and one liter rapid infusion. So again, if you look at our protocol, uh, we've got it down so that if the patient is pinned uh, prior to extrication, we're going to give them 50 milliequivalents in a total of two liters over one hour. So uh, that's what we want to do, and we want to um, get that started. So uh, it's basically, for me, I put uh, 25 milliequivalents in each liter and then just run them in a total over an hour. Last question on this patient. Uh, Post-release, your patient's blood pressure drops to 54 over 20. How much fluid should you administer, and what is your goal to stop? So, um, again, if you look at our protocol, um, the best answer is oop, is uh, 20, um, 20 milliliters uh, per kilo oh, as fast as you can until you get a, ra a radial pulse back. I'm sorry, a little too quick on the switch there. Question number 13. If you're caring for the 78-year-old or for 78 with acute right-sided weakness and slurred speech, uh, last normal 15 be minutes before you arrive, uh, she has right facial droop, is unable to lift her right arm, and has no grip in the right hand. You are five minutes from a primary stroke center and 20 minutes from a comprehensive stroke center. What are appropriate actions? Check a finger stick, uh, evaluate for trauma, obtain a past medical history, check a medication list, transport to the comprehensive stroke center, 
or all of the above. Well, if you look at this, she's got a right facial droop. She can't lift her right arm. And she's got no grip. That gives you a lambs of five. So if you look at our protocol, uh, our protocol says um, that we are going to transport the patient to the closest comprehensive stroke center if we can get there in uh, 30 minutes or less uh, over and above what it would take to get to the primary. So we are going to check a finger stick blood sugar. We're going to make sure the patient is not hypoglycemic. We're going to evaluate for head trauma. Maybe the patient fell. Now they have a subdural hematoma. Check their past medical history. Maybe they have a history of seizure disorder. It might be postictal. Uh, get a medication list. You know, for us in the emergency department, the key meds for us are going to be uh, any, any antiplatelet medications such as aspirin or Plavix and any anticoagulants like, his, like Coumadin, Eliquis, or Xeralto. And again, we're going to transport to the closest uh, comprehensive stroke center. So if your travel time to primary is five minutes, your tra transport time to comprehensive is 20, you go to the comprehensive. Uh, so if you look at the uh, American Stroke Association guidelines, patients with the LAMS 4 or 5, those patients who are most likely to have a large vessel occlusion should go to the closest comprehensive stroke center unless it's more than 30 minutes to get there, over and above your usual transport times to the next level. So uh, it doesn't matter whether another facility is primary or thrombectomy capable. LAMS 4s and 5s where, where there's suggestion of large vessel occlusion go to comprehensive uh, because they've got the best, uh, best setup to manage these patients. Question 14. You're dispatched on an ill patient. Uh, you arrive at, find a 31-year-old female who is a G3 para 2. She's 38 weeks gestation. She's complaining of severe headache. The baby is active and she reports no vaginal bleeding. Blood pressure is 160 over 110. She's got three plus pitting ankle edema and pedal edema. She neurologically appears intact. Which action is not appropriate? Should you initiate mag sulfate? Should you transport an OB unit? Should the patient uh, be placed on a cardiac monitor? Um, should you put them or her in a left lateral decubitus position? Should you start IV or administer IV fentanyl? Well, if you look at um, guidelines, this patient is preeclamptic. She's at risk to have a seizure. If she has a seizure, that's an immediate life threat to her and to her baby. Uh, our treatment is mag sulfate. So in the emergency department, we would probably give her four grams, but we're, our protocol is two grams infusion. Uh, at the receiving facility, they'll give her more. Uh, patient needs to go to a facility with an obstetrical unit. So she is not a candidate to go to a freestanding or a hospital that does not have obstetrical capabilities. Placing the patient in the left lateral decubitus position, you get the baby off, you know, the baby goes to the left, it gets the weight of the, of the baby and the uterus off of the inferior vena cava, it improves circulation, that's a preferred thing to do. Uh, cardiac monitor is important uh, because this patient has the potential to deteriorate quickly, so cardiac monitor is important. From my perspective, fentanyl is, is not really indicated at this point. Uh, what we need to do is everything else. You know, if everything else is done, you've got the mag sulfate running and so on, you want to give some fentanyl, uh, maybe. But I, my preference is avoid the fentanyl, uh, watch for seizures because this patient may seize, uh, get the mag sulfate started, and get that patient transported. So from my perspective, fentanyl is, is, is not a great action in this patient. The other reason not to give this patient fentanyl is if she develop, goes into labor or has to be quickly delivered, that fentanyl can cross the um, placenta and could sedate the baby um, you know, upon delivery. So I would make the, uh, let, let the obstetricians decide whether or not the patient needs a narcotic. Okay. So this is a post-arrest patient. Uh, this, you can tell this is actually one of our real cases. Um, this patient's post-arrest, what is your interpretation? Do you think it's sinus tachycardia? Do you think it's sinus tach with acute inferior and anterior MI? Do you think it's a sinus tach with aberrancy? Do you think it's atrial flutter with RVR? Or do you just think it's a bad tracing and nobody should have submitted this? Well, from my perspective, if you look at it, it, it is sinus tach. The heart rate is up. It's over 100, so it's sinus tach. If you look at it, it's, it's, it, to me, it's a good quality tracing. There's not a lot of baseline artifact on this. I don't think, I can see P waves, so I don't, I don't see this as atrial uh, flutter. So I think this is sinus tach with an acute anterior inferior STEMI. You can see those big tombstones there anteriorly, and I don't have an arrow for it, but if you look at leads um, one, uh, one, two, and 
you know, the lateral chest leads, it, it, the patient's got anterior and inferior changes and even some lateral changes. So this is a big one. This is a big infarct. Um, this patient needs to go to the cath lab. All right, you arrive on scene, unresponsive 17-month-old, child's pale, response only to pain, shallow respirations, poor perfusion, initial heart rate's 50, respiratory rate's 12. What is the next... What is the next thing you should do for this patient? What's the quickest first action should you take? Should you futz with an IV and give epi? Uh, should you give uh, atropine? Uh, should you put the patient on a non-rebreather mask? So what do you think? For me, I would start this patient on 100% FiO2 by VVM. It's quick. It's your first priority. You get that child oxygenated. Typically, once you get this children like this oxygenated, their pulse rate will pick up and they will become more responsive. So the, this child's problem is they're hypoxic um, because, of bradycar because of a slow respiratory rate. Get this kid oxygenated, and they will do better. Okay, another one. You're dispatched to a local dialysis center, and uh, on arrival, staff advised you to 57-year-old male was on dialysis when the dialysis line became disconnected. Patient uh, became unresponsive after that. You found the patient diaphoretic, unresponsive, uh, hypotensive, tachycardic with decreased respirations, and his O2 saturation is 90%. He has a capped dual lumen dialysis catheter in the right upper pectoral area, small amount of blood on the patient's chest, uh, and what would you do? So pick all that apply. So should you augment respirations with a BVM and oxygen, put him in a Trendelenburg on his left side, provide a fluid bolus, administer 110 uh, mLs of 1 to 10,000 epi, uh, or check a finger stick blood sugar. So I definitely would augment respirations with a BVM. I would definitely put this patient in a Trendelenburg on his left side. Why would I do that? Well, if you look at the, the story, uh, the uh, cap or the dialysis line became disconnected. When that happens, patients are at risk for an air embolism. So air gets suctioned or gets sucked into the open catheter, goes into the uh, central circulation. It can result in hypotension and all the things that he's got listed above. And the treatment for that is to put the patient on the left side uh, with their head down. And what that does is it helps trap the air in the right ventricle apex, the right ventricle apex, so it doesn't go out into the lungs or other areas. You can provide a fluid bolus. The patient may respond to it. Um, 1 to 10,000 epi, uh, really not something I would do. Um, what I might consider is setting up a uh, 1 to 100,000 uh, epi uh, infusion and do some push dose of, you know, two or three milliliters of, of the solution. That may give you some uh, improvement to patient's blood pressure. Um, and I would also check the patient's blood sugar. Again, think of other things that can cause this. It's not just air embolism. It's not just blood loss. The patient could have become hypoglycemic. So just for fun, I threw in this photo. If you look at the arrows, uh, those arrows are air in the central system. So the top left, those you can see uh, some uh, air in the pulmonary artery. Uh, if you look in the uh, top right, you can that arrow is pointing at some air that's in the right ventricle. Same thing in the bottom left. Um, the bottom right really doesn't show much from my perspective, but you can see where air has gone as part of an air embolism. If uh, you know if, if this gets pushed forward, it may cause obstruction in the uh, in the lungs. Uh, and if if the patient has uh, we call it patent foramen ovale, which is an opening between the right side of the heart and left side of the heart, that blood or that air can cross over from the right side to the left side, and you can have an air embolism to the brain or to an extremity or the gut, all of which can give you like stroke-like symptoms or other, other uh, injuries related to that. So that air is going to block blood flow. All right, you've taken a 35-year-old to the hospital. You're dispatched on a seizure. However, the patient was post dictal on your arrival. Finger stick blood sugar is okay. Cardiac monitor shows sinus tack. You've got an IV started. The patient remains post-dictal, then suffers another grand mal seizure. How do you treat this patient? Do you give midazolam 10 milligrams intranasal, 10 milligrams intramuscular, 4 milligrams IV push, uh, ketamine milligram per kilogram, or drapiridol? Well, if you think about it, you know, the patient needs something to stop the seizure. Midazolam is our first-line drug. You have an IV in place. Um, so give the patient four milligrams of midazolam IV. If the patient had no IV in place, then you could administer either intranasal or intramuscular midazolam, uh, but this patient has an IV, so give the IV route. Ketamine is available as an option. 
you look at our protocol though, ketamine is used for patients who do not respond to midazolam. Ketamine can be used to abort seizures, but in this patient, uh, they have not received any uh, benzodiazepines prior to your arrival. So we're going to go with midazolam first. And then droperidol is, has no role in uh, management of seizures. So even though it's a substitute for ketamine in behavioral emergencies, it does not work for seizures and you should not use it in that circumstance. Number 19, uh, you arrive on scene with an auto accident with a car into a large tree. Driver is pinned and suffered a massive injury to the mid and lower face. He has a palpable carotid pulse and agonal respirations. His GCS is six. Once the scene is secure, what are your first actions? So this one, I, I think you can, we can have active discussion over the best choice, but I'll give you mine in a moment. You can reposition the jaw, suction the mouth, start high flow oxygen and place an eye gel. So, you know, the first thing you do is reposition the jaw, see if it moves the tongue out of the way. Uh, you know, suction out blood and gore. You can attempt a nasal tracheal intubation. Now, you don't want to do that. He's got mid-face injury. If he has a uh, fracture of the mid-face, it's at high risk to uh, cause complications. Uh, so nasal tracheal intubation is not indicated. You can reposition the jaw, suction the mouth, start high flow oxygen, and perform a crike. You can start oxygen and just hope for the best. Or you can intubate the patient after the patient is extricated. You know, for me, the question is, should we go with option A or option C? I would go with option C. The reason is, um, yes, we're going to reposition the jaw. That may help. We can suction the blood and gore out of the mouth. That may help. We can start high flow oxygen. But if you have a patient with uh, mid and lower face trauma, I really don't know if an eye gel is going to work. Um, you know, is, is it going to seal appropriately? I think I would just suck it up and uh, get the patient uh, uh, in a good position, do the things that we've got listed, and then just go right to a cricothyrotomy. Um, definitely don't want to just uh, start oxygen, hope for the best, and you don't want to wait till the patient's extricated. Uh, I didn't put any details in here about the extrication, but if it's a 10 or 15 minute extrication, this patient will be dead before you manage their airway. So for me, I would, I would go with the crike rather than eye gel. Again, this is one of those questions I put in there to prompt discussion, and I think we can argue either way. But I wanted to go with what I consider the best answer, which is C. Patient stabbed in the right groin. On your arrival, he's diaphoretic, agitated, has pulse style bleeding from the groin. Scene has been secured by the police. What is your first action? Oxygen, IV, vital signs, pack the wound with gauze and apply pressure, or check for peripheral pulses. So, you know, this comes down to, is it ABCs or XABC? And for me, X stands for controlled bleeding. This patient's going to bleed out before you get an IV started. So for me, it's get the bleeding controlled. You get some gauze down in the wound, you put direct pressure, you put your knee into it if you have to. If you happen to have a junctional tourniquet, use that. This patient uh, needs to have bleeding control. People can bleed out from a groin injury in three or four minutes. So you don't fool around with this. Get the bleeding control first. Everything else is secondary. All right, here's an MCI. Uh, so you have a 55-year-old male. He fell during a bleacher's collapse. He was impelled, impaled by a piece of metal framing in the right lower abdomen. The framing piece is protruding about eight inches. There is no exit wound. His only complaint is abdominal pain. Um, there's no active bleeding you can see with metal in place. He's alert, then becomes more weak and drowsy. So if you look at uh, our salt triage criteria, he can wave when instructed. Uh, he does have pulses and his breathing is normal. How would you rate him? Is he going to be minimal, delayed, immediate, or expected? Well, from my perspective, he is uh, immediate and I'll tell you why. So if you look at our salt triage, he can wave. So our global sorting, he's, he passes the test there. If you look at it, he is breathing. Um, but from my perspective, uh, hemorrhage is not controlled. So externally, we don't see any bleeding, but he's got this piece of metal sticking out of his abdomen. We have no idea if it's involved with um, any major vascular structure, such as you know the uh, vena cava or the aorta or the iliac vessels. Um, if you look at the scenario, his sensorium, his alertness is starting to deteriorate. So from my perspective, uh, we don't know if there's major bleeding or not. I would make him an immediate. So the answer here is C, immediate. So that's how I, how I look at this case. Next question. Patient, you have a patient that's uh, intoxicated in custody and, like, and like, uh, the police would like to take him to jail. But they first want you to, quote, clear the patient. So be, be aware of the word clear. 
uh, you know, that means that you evaluate the patient and that you don't see any risk to them uh, by going with the police. The patient has a forehead abrasion that appears acute, has a pulse of 120, and vomited once prior to your arrival. Can you clear him to be left in police custody? Yes or no? My answer to this is no. Um, so if you look at our, our definition of the intoxicated patient, um, incapacitated, incapacitating intoxication is defined in any circumstance where you have an injury above the clavicle. So this guy has a forehead abrasion. He has signs of acute illness or injury. He's got the abrasion. He's got, had been vomiting. Uh, his GCS is 13. I didn't indicate what was on here. It's probably around the 14. And it has abnormal vital, abnormal vital signs, uh, specifically a blood or a uh, pulse rate uh, that's up or blood pressure that's down. So I, I think this guy, from my perspective, um, cannot be cleared. So the answer is no. He has to go with you to the, to the hospital for a check. And that's because of his injury above the clavicles. One thing that we added uh, in the 2024 protocol is, uh, if you look at the bottom of this box that I pulled out of the protocol, law enforcement can now be considered a responsible person. So if the patient is intoxicated, uh, they don't qualify as incapacitating intoxication. Uh, and law enforcement, uh, or the patient can be left in the custody of law enforcement. You don't have to find a family member or somebody else to take them home. All right. Here's another patient. Your partner just successfully intubated a patient following a DSI protocol. The patient's blood pressure was 130 over 85 prior to intubation. It's now down to 80 over 60. What are appropriate actions? So this patient has suffered uh, post-intubation hypotension. We'll see that at times. You know, patients are so hepped up on adrenaline because of their respiratory distress that as soon as we relieve that respiratory distress, their blood pressure drops. So what are you going to do? Are you going to see what happens? Uh, are you going to bolus with normal saline? Are you going to uh, administer 10 mLs of 1 to 10,000 epi? Are you going to give 2 mLs of 1 to 100,000 and repeat every 5 as needed? Are you going to check tube position? So from my perspective, you definitely don't want to wait to see what happens. You need to start something. Um, bolusing with normal saline is a good option, so you can give them 500 bolus. Uh, I would not give them uh, 10 mLs of 1 to 10,000 of epi. That's the you know, patient is not in cardiac arrest. Uh, but administering 2 mLs of 1 to 100,000 epi makes sense. Again, we mix up our drip as part of our DSI protocol. And then we can give another 2 mLs as a push dose every 5 minutes as needed for blood pressure. And then always think about checking tube position. So whenever a patient is, who is intubated has change in their clinical status, go back and check the tube. You know, is the tube in good position? Have they developed a pneumothorax? Uh, is there any complication related to the tube that may cause this new change in the patient's condition? So if this patient's condition has dropped, his pressure is now 80 over 60, check that tube position. Is it truly in the, esoph or in the uh, trachea or is it in the right main stem? Is it in the esophagus? So don't forget to take a look at the tube. For this patient, we're going to uh, use 1 to 100,000 epi, so how do we mix it up? Do we add 1 milligram? which is 1 mL or 1 vial of 1 to 1,000 uh, epi to 100 mL of saline? Do we add 5 milligrams of epinephrine to a, a liter of normal saline? Or do we take 1 mL from a saline flush and then add 1 mL of 1 to 1,000? So I know this requires some math, but uh, if you look at it, look at our protocol, we are going to add 1 milligram of epinephrine, which is a 1 mL vial, a 1 one ml vial of 1 to 1,000 epinephrine. We're going to put in 100 cc's of normal saline, which gives us a 1 to 100,000 mix of epinephrine that we can use either for infusion or as a push dose presser. 5 milligrams to epinephrine to 1 liter is just wrong. Uh, and then uh, C, adding, uh, removing an ml of uh, saline flush thinning, adding 1 ml of 1 to 1,000 basically gives you 1 to 10,000 epinephrine. This is the dilution we've done in the past when 1 to 10,000 epinephrine for cardiac arrest has been on back order. So the correct answer, again, is A. And it's in the protocol. Look under the epi infusion if you need to, need to be prompted. Okay, you have a two-year-old after accidental ingestion. Child was grandmother and took one of grandmother's medications. Mom is unsure which medication the child took, but states grandma has a long list of meds. On exam, the child is unresponsive, not breathing, but wakes with sternal rub, nods off again and stops breathing. You begin bagging and give naloxone with no, not much of a change. Decision is made to intubate the patient. Um, your partner is contacting medical control. What medications will you prepare for intubation? Ketamine and succinylcholine. 
uh, ketamine uh, succinylcholine and atropine, ketamine sucks and Versed, or ketamine only. And if, you know, again, if you look at our protocol, our protocol says ketamine and succinylcholine. And, and you know, again, looking at the protocol, it says uh, you don't use these meds for a child under 12, but what you also need to consider is, according to this scenario, your, your partner's contacting medical control, me, in which case I would say, go ahead and intubate, use ketamine and sucks. So I would prepare this child for intubation using our routine protocol. Um, the difference is it's a two-year-old, call me. You're called to evaluate a six-year-old child with burn injury from hot noodles. Which of the following indicates for transport to a pediatric burn center? Uh, secondary burns to the chest involving a nipple, uh, circumferential burns of uh, the forearm, first-degree uh, burn over the elbow, well, A and B. So any substantial secondary bur degree burns in a, in a six-year-old needs to be transported. Any circumferential burn, meaning it, the burn goes all the way around the extremity, in this case the forearm, needs to go to a burn center um, because they can, they can uh, develop uh, compartment syndrome and they might need surgery to decompress the forearm. So th for, be for item B, that's true for adults and children. And again, secondary burns on the chest involving a nipple, that's, that's a sensitive area. That child should be seen at a, at a pediatric burn facility. So for, for the, uh, ca this case, the correct answer is A and B. You're called to a doctor's office, transport a six-year-old with asthma uh, exacerbation, has already received three aduanebs and oral steroids, continues to have respiratory distress. O2 sat is down, uh, you know, uh, because O2 sat of 78%. Patient's tachypneic with nasal flaring and retractions, uh, nasal flaring and retractions of the uh, muscles between the ribs. That si assigns the child's in trouble. There's diffuse wheezing, even though the child's received three aduanebs. The single next best treatment is what? IV and prepare for intubation, start CPAP, nebulize racemic, uh, epi, epinephrine, um, IM, or nebulize saline. And for me, this is really a two-parter. Um, you know, um, the child uh, should be on CPAP, and that does make a difference. Uh, it's really quick. It's easy. It will help the child tremendously. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the protocol, you can also use epinephrine. Um, as a treatment, uh, and you know which is the next best option. Well, really, for me, B and C or B and D are good options. The question of next option is which one can you get done first? It might take you longer to get the CPAP set up than to give the epinephrine, uh, or you may already have the CPAP out and available. Um, you know, if I had both immediately available, I'd do the CPAP and then do the epi. But either of these are good next steps. Uh, it just depends on which one you can get started faster. Whichever can you get faster, go with that one first and then do the second. Ill person, frail 91-year-olds, unresponsive, bradycardic, and hypotensive. Daughter is present, asks that her mother not be aggressively treated or transported. Uh, the daughter does not have an Ohio DNR form. Which options are permissible? So you got to think uh, a little out of the box on this uh, because more than one option here is permissible depending on uh, which route you want to go. So you can very much, you know, without a DNR form, you have no obligation to um, honor the daughter's requests. In Ohio, uh, EMS providers can only act either upon physician order, a verbal order, or with an Ohio DNR form. So if there's no DNR form, you can elect to innovate, administer atropine and fluid bolus and transport. Um, you know, in which case you can advise the daughter that you're in a spot where you have to treat and let the hospital can sort out the details. So if, if it's your circumstance, this may be one of your options. You can also call me and receive a verbal DNR order, and that has been done frequently. I can give you a verbal order. The state says you can accept an order as long as you know who the physician is or you can verify their identity. Well, hopefully you know who I am and you call me on the medical control line, you explain the circumstances to me, and I can give you an order to not resuscitate the patient. Um, you can uh, transport the patient in a position of comfort with minimal interventions as well. So if the patient looks frail, uh, looks like they're in trouble, but they don't need immediate interventions, uh, and you anticipate they're not going to die in the next 10 or 15 minutes, you can just transport in a position of comfort with minimal interventions. And you can tell the daughter that without the form, you can't um, uh, not act, but you will do the least amount of things necessary until the patient's at the hospital where 
the staff and the physician at the hospital can sort out the details. Now, oops, uh, staying at the house and waiting for the patient dies is not a, not a legitimate option, although we've had several agencies in the past have called me about this. They want to stay with the patient. The patient's almost dead, and I give them a verbal DNR order, and they stay on scene for the next five or ten minutes until the patient has died. That's an option, but I, you can't just do it without talking to me or having a DNR form. All right. Um, so heads up, uh, CPR is performed in patient cardiac arrest, patients at home in a systole since you arrived. You've been at it for 20 minutes. You've used up your epi. Uh, you're given five doses, which is the max per protocol. So what do you do now? Um, do you terminate? Do you continue CPR and begin conversation with the family regarding the need to terminate? Do you give more epi, or do you just transport the patient in the rest? So from my perspective, the answer is B. Um, you have to prepare the family. I, I think it's in this day and age, it's inappropriate to just stop and tell them you're done. Um, yes, I understand that we max out at five doses, and you may use up those five doses in the first 20 minutes, but we want to, we want to give it at least 30 minutes. Um, at this time, we are not changing the protocol. It's going to stay at 30 minutes. So uh, you continue CPR, begin conversation, uh, with the family about need to terminate, and at 30 minutes you can stop. Um, but uh, we don't just stop at 20 minutes. And then uh, we really, there is no need to give additional epinephrine, and we don't transport patients in arrest like this. So you have to wait at least 30 minutes. All right, this one I've used before, but I liked it, so I thought I'd do it again. Uh, you're dispatched uh, on an auto accident. On your arrival, you find this patient. She was applying mascara when uh, the accident occurred. So you basically see the mascara wand impaled into her left eye. So how do you manage this patient? Um, do you stabilize the mascara pin, cover the both eyes with gauze? Do you transport in a supine position? Do you evaluate for other injuries or do you do, or you do all of it? Well, the answer is you do it all. So uh, you want to stabilize the pin so it doesn't move. You want to cover both eyes so that uh, you minimize the amount of eye movement. So because the, the, the left eye is, injury does, is injured, doesn't mean it's not going to move uh, when the patient looks around. So if you cover both eyes um, with gauze, then the, the uh, pen will be uh, stabilized and the patient has no reason or, or to look around. Uh, we want to keep the patient in a supine position. That's what we do with eye injuries. We don't put the head up. And we look for other injuries. So yes, this is a, a bad injury, but don't be distracted by this single injury. You have to do your complete trauma assessment. So look, look for other injuries. So here's, a, here's our protocol. We stabilize impaled objects, cover both eyes for transport. Um, if, if the object has pierced the globe, has pierced the eyeball, in which case this does, uh, transport in supine position, cover both eyes with four by fours, metal shield if you can apply it. In this case, I don't think that's going to work. And, you know, uh, keep the patient comfortable. All right, 31. 22-year-old female with abdominal pain. She reports she has a positive pregnancy test and now has vaginal bleeding. She does not remember when her last period was. What could be the source of her pain and bleeding? Um, so, uh, and I, I, this, is, this is one I based on years of experience um, with women in pregnancy. So, you know, all bets are off on this patient from my perspective. You know, she could be suffering a miscarriage. Um, she could have an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, you know, she doesn't know when her last period is. We've had patients show up in the emergency department who don't remember when they had a last period or they've been spotting. Um, they are um, uh, on the large size. They may be a little obese, and they are actually uh, in ter have been pregnant now or at term. So it, for this patient, all bets are off. It could be a miscarriage. It could be an ectopic pregnancy. So uh, those two things happen in the, f you know, the first trimester or so. It could be a placenta previa where the placenta overlaps um, the opening of the cervix and now there's bleeding through the cervix. It could be a placental uh, abruption. So the placenta could be separating from the uterus. Um, and um, you know, she could also uh, be term and now uh, having labor. So the answer for me is all of the above. So unless she, she can tell you that she is, you know, 12 weeks along based on an ultrasound she had last week or that she's 36 weeks, uh, the assumption is she is having some complication of pregnancy and, uh, you know, it, it could be uh, any of these items listed. Okay. So we have uh, another one. A, uh, the wife of a 45-year-old male calls 911 after she finds her husband unresponsive in the basement with an empty bottle of Furcardism CD, 180 milligrams. 
uh, that was filled yesterday. His blood pressure is 80 over 65, his pulse ox is low, and this is his monitor strip. So what do you do? So, you know, what are we going to think about? So his, his uh, O2 sat is low at 86%, so we need to assure the patient's able to protect their airway, and we're probably going to need to provide some supplemental oxygen, if not supplement his breathing for the BVM. Uh, we, uh, he is hypotensive uh, and bradycardic, uh, so a fluid bolus may help. Um, you know, she said she found Carter's MCD at, the, at the, his side, but, you know, nar um, narcotics may be in play as well. So uh, nothing lost by giving some intranasal or IV um, uh, Narcan. Um, if you look at our protocol, um, calcium chloride uh, IV is uh, indicated for calcium channel blockers. Uh, Cardizem is a calcium channel blocker. And um, basically, uh, calcium is one of the antidotes. Um, you can also, you should also check the blood sugar. Again, maybe he's diabetic uh, and his issue is not just his overdose, but hypoglycemia. So from, uh, you know, the correct answer here is all of the above. In the emergency department, we're going to continue with calcium, uh, assuming this is a calcium channel overdose. The other treatments we have is sometimes we'll put patients on high dose of intravenous uh, insulin as well as dextrose as D10. Uh, even in patients who are not diabetic. It's been shown that insulin and dextrose will help reverse calcium channel uh, overdose. And the last thing sometimes we'll use is something called intralipid, which is, it looks like uh, cream, but it, what it does is it's fatty, um, fatty fluid that's infused and the lipid actually absorbs um, the chemical, the, the drug, so that it, there's less drug available uh, to cause problems. Those are not things we do in the field, but just, just a matter of uh, you know, kind of keeping you updated on current treatment. So Carter's MCD is probably one of the worst overdoses I've seen has been a calcium channel blocker. Um, beta blockers as well uh, can be nasty to manage in the emergency department. Very similar approach. All right. Daycare center, three-year-old boy findings after eating a cookie. He's allergic to peanuts. Uh, he weighs 14 kilos. What do you do first? Uh, nebulized albuterol. Uh, 0.15 milligrams of uh, 1 to 1,000 epi, uh, 3 mLs of 1 to 10,000 epi IM, uh, 0 0.1 milligrams of 1 to 1,000 epi IM, or 0 0.3 milligrams of 1 to 1,000 uh, epinephrine IM. So which one do you think? So uh, from, you know, if you look at what we've done, uh, we have made some adjustments in our epinephrine dosing. Um, and the do correct dose for a child of 14 kilos is 0.1 milligrams of 1 to 1,000. Um, nebulized albuterol may be of benefit, but when you have a patient like this with an acute allergic reaction, um, the first thing we do, our first priority is to get an intramuscular dose of epinephrine in the patient. So, um, you know, whether it's an EpiPen or we pull it up out of our vial. If you look at this child, the face is swollen, he's got uh, hives like rash. Uh, this, this kid has a potential to get worse. So we have uh, changed our protocol a little bit with epinephrine. Uh, this was impromptu uh, to a large extent by the change in the uh, scope of practice for EMTs. EMTs can now administer epinephrine uh, by drawing it up from a vial. So if you look on the left-hand side um, under uh, that red box epinephrine auto-injector, um, we can either use the epinephrine auto-injector if the patient has it, or you can dose epinephrine. And we've basically put the dosing range uh, in line with what the EpiPens and AdrenalClix have. So if you look at these um, auto-injectors, they're for kids under 15, or 15 kilos and under, 15 to 30 kilos and over 30, and we have set doses of epinephrine. And um, that's what we are now doing. The other thing that you need to, to note is in the protocol now, uh, for paramedics, uh, the dose for epinephrine follows the same dosing schedule as for uh, children. So there's no longer uh, the 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of epinephrine. If you have a patient uh, over of 30 kilos and over, they get uh, 0 0.3 milligrams, regardless of their size. So uh, that's what we're doing. The other thing we're doing is um, we're going to a dose-limited um, dose limiting syringe for epinephrine injection. So that's going to be used for either paramedics, advanced, or EMTs. It's going to have three markings on it. It's going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and 0 0.3, and you can't pull up more than 0 0.3, and that's a patient safety issue. 
Um, if you are an EMT, um, you can administer epinephrine using this protocol. Once you've completed training, um, that has been developed and will be pushed out to our EMS coordinator. So because there's a change in scope, doesn't mean there's a change in your authorization. You will be authorized to administer epinephrine based on this schedule after you complete the training program that's going to come out in the next few weeks. Um, so uh, that is what we've done. All right, bonus question. So you're dispatched on a diabetic emergency. On arrival, the patient is diaphoretic, confused with a blood sugar of 25. The patient has a history of diabetes, alcoholic cirrhosis, and uh, liver failure, no visible veins. How do you treat the patient's hypoglycemia? So do you give them glucagon intranasally? Do you give them glucagon IM? Do you uh, drill them with an IO and give them D10? Or do you give them oral glucose? Well, I think to answer this question, you have to look at the uh, how I've got it set up. You have a patient with who's alcoholic with alcoholic cirrhosis and liver failure. Well, for glucagon to work, you have to have something called glycogen available in the body. Glycogen is how glucose is stored in the body. It is principally stored in the liver. If you have liver failure and cirrhosis, your body has very little glycogen. So giving a patient who is cirrhotic a dose of glucagon is unlikely to be effective because there's no glycogen to release. Whereas uh, dextrose is dextrose. Um, oral glucose, probably not a good idea in this patient who is confused and may not be able to take oral uh, dextrose, oral glucose, and is a high risk to aspirate and choke. So from my perspective, this patient is hypoglycemic. The, the best we have treated is to drill him and give him uh, D10. Again, glucagon works well for diabetics with normal livers. Glucagon does not work well, uh, if at all, for anybody who's got a cirrhotic or damaged liver. So go, f go for the IV or the IO, give D10. Uh, oral glucose, again, um, based on this scenario, I'd be uh, reluctant to give because the patient's at risk to aspirate and get into trouble. Last one. So you're caring for a 70-year-old female passed out for three to four minutes. The event was witnessed by her husband who helped her to the floor. She is now awake and alert without any visible injury or complaint of pain, which is not an appropriate action. Obtain a 12 lead, check a finger stick, give Narcan, perform a stroke screen, or obtain orthostatic vital signs. So there's one incorrect action. Uh, well, patients had syncope. EKG is always indicated regardless of age. So syncope uh, in a 20-year-old, particularly if it's a 20-year-old athlete, EKG um, and cardiac monitoring. If it's a 70-year-old female, even more important, get the 12 lead. Finger stick blood sugar, um, I didn't say whether the patient is diabetic or not. Patient could be hyperglycemic, get the finger stick. Uh, administer Narcan. My question is why? She's awake and alert. She's doing well. Uh, Narcan's not going to do anything. I would perform a stroke screen because you don't know if the patient's had a stroke or not until you do the stroke screen. And then orthostatic vital signs are also important. She could have had, she could be orthostatic because of medications or fluid loss or inadequate uh, uh, consumption of fluids. So for me, the um, correct answer is, uh, or correct inappropriate action, the most inappropriate action is to administer Narcan. She doesn't need it. She's awake, alert, talking. I'm not worried about uh, narcotic overdose. And again, the reason we give somebody Narcan is for re to have resumption of respirations. It's not to make a diagnosis. We give Narcan because somebody's not breathing well, uh, and we want to see if they can respond and avoid intubating the patient. So Narcan's not a, used as a diagnostic uh, drug. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, send them to me or Dr. Kaddish, uh, particularly the pediatric questions, Dr. Kaddish, or, or post it on Ask a Doc on Basecamp. So that's it. Thank you very much.